he died smiling. He died with a smile on his face, peacefully. And I was told by those that saw it, and many did, my brothers, my brother, my sisters, my stepmother and others who had witnessed it, that it was a life-changing moment for them to see a man end his life smiling. And virtue had conquered peril, had conquered not just fear, pain, danger, but had transcended. So I think of my father when I'm doing what I'm doing. And I remind myself when ego raises itself on a regular basis that there are life lessons around us and answers to the questions around us every day if we touch base with those. And whilst we've spoken about law and documents and paperwork and administration and fraudism and the madness of these people, something we haven't really spent enough time on, nearly enough, is what is virtue? What makes virtue such a key element here? Why? What can it teach us? What is this issue of ego? What is mind virus? How do we deal with it? Because if the essence of our problem, in fact, is less about what we think are real and present threats and more about how we conduct ourselves, then even if I was to say to you, the money system's up and here you go, here's all the money you need, here's all the credit you need, here's all the remedy, would that really solve the essential issues we're facing. Well, some would say it wouldn't hurt, and I agree. Um, I've, I've said to a number of you, and I want to thank all of you who have helped. I find myself still in financial difficulty. And that is because of uh, the choices I've made and because of the decisions I've made. I have the ability to make money, but at the moment I'm choosing to focus on completing this. And so it's making it it's harder. So virtue you can't eat. But what if one of the issues we're facing here is how we perceive and use our talents, how we perceive the problems and whether the problems themselves are in fact problems of perspective as much as problems of uh, real and, and present danger. So I'm going to talk about that, virtue. What is virtue? And I'm certainly going to talk about now peril. So let me get started by something we think we know, but I was surprised to discover the true meaning of it was something entirely different. But I'm going to talk about the word fear. I've spoken about the word fear before, and it is an issue. It's an issue for all of us. People are concerned. People say, well, I go to court, there's a fear that they'll put me away. I go to court, there's a fear that they'll take my family. There's a fear that they'll come and arrest me any time. Uh, there's a fear that the economy will completely collapse. There's a fear that uh, Elenin is the brown dwarf and coming to destroy us. There's all these fears in our lives, and I'm no different to you. There's fears upon fears upon fears. And whilst I've said to you in the last few weeks, things are going to be okay, I haven't necessarily helped yet, I think, in addressing this central issue of, well, how do we tackle our fears? How do we remove these fears or address these fears in our life? Well, what is the meaning of the word fear? Where does it come from? What did it mean? Well, if you look at a dictionary, if you look at an encyclopedia, they'll tell you that Fear effectively means uh, calamity, peril, that word peril I've, I mentioned, sudden danger, risk of death, all negative things. A, a state of distressed negative sensation, potentially crippling emotional state of mind and body induced by some perceived threat in the mind. Fear. 
the most potent weapon of the present system. Well, is that the original meaning of the word fear? Turns out it's not. The word fear actually originates from the first millennium BCE, so before the birth of Yeshua, Christ Jesus, before the emergence of Christianity, and it comes from Gaelic. It doesn't come from Old English, it doesn't come from Sanskrit, it doesn't come from High German or, or any other. It comes from Gaelic. And the word is the same. Fear, F-E-A-R, comes from Gaelic. Fear. And it means faithful man or brave man, faithful or honourable bloodshed or slaughter. And it also means ground. Well, let me repeat that because you're probably saying, what? <laughs> so let me repeat it. This is the true original meaning of the word fear. Faithful man or brave man, faithful or honourable bloodshed or slaughter or ground. Now it comes from two ancient, very ancient words that go back to the beginning of language. Fe or fi, F-E, meaning faith, bravery and belief. And you'll find that fi has that common origin across many, many languages. Faith, bravery and belief. In fact, Latin, which was created later, has uh, fides, again, from fi. So faith, bravery, belief. And then ar, meaning for, on, upon, bloodshed, massacre, ar or slaughter. Now, this is from Gaelic. So I know that there are many, many definitions out there about fear. I know that many, many people would say, hold on a second, I don't know what you're talking about but I'm explaining the origin of it. Fear did not mean, in its original meaning, calamity, sudden danger, risk of death. It meant faithful man, brave man, faithful or honourable bloodshed or slaughter. Gaelic. So how did it come to be our worst enemy? How did it come to be the thing that paralyses us so many times in our life that when there's a knock at the door, we are literally hiding under the bed at some point. And you know what I'm talking about. That our life has come to the point that when the shadow moves past the, the, the front of our door, we fear this is the time they've come to take us. Well, before Afghanistan, the Afghanistan of Europe was Ireland. And from the 12th century, when wave after wave after wave of mercenaries were sent in there to subdue, defeat, kill, poison, destroy the Irish and turn it into a car park, faced with the Irish warriors that would die to the last man and were experts at the uh, use of warfare of berserk, uh, someone in a state of berserk is a crazy man. A crazy man that has got the energy of 10 men. And midst that, the word fear acquired the concerns and the peril and the danger, not of those that had virtue, but those that did not have virtue. Those that were willing to be paid as mercenaries to kill others. Not because it was their faith, but because they made money from it. And so the invaders came to interpret the word as calamity, sudden danger, and risk of death. So when we don't live in a virtuous world, when we don't live authentically, when we don't live truthfully in our life, then in a sense we are like those invaders of Ireland many centuries ago and so fear is real. But when we live our lives truthfully and authentically, when we are honest with our feelings, when we understand our own egos, 
then we have absolutely nothing to fear, literally by the word. Now, if the Egyptians are true, and to name a thing for what it is, is to take its power, then I have just given you the original power of the meaning of fear, and you have nothing to worry about. So let's move on, and let's talk about what we mean by virtue. Because we keep coming back to this virtue, and I know when I say the word virtue, what my first impression would be, if I didn't know more about it, is that I must live some altruistic moral life and, and deprive myself of certain things. That's not true, in fact. And you'll see in a moment why it's not true. Virtue is to live authentically, is to live knowingly in the present. And I'll show you exactly what that means by explaining what is the essence of emotion and what is the essence of ego. Because understanding what ego tries to do and understand what authentic emotions try to do, you'll see that virtue is nothing more than keeping your ego under check. That's all. Just keeping your ego under check. Living the present moment, seeing things for what they are, and not allowing these mind virus programs to dominate your mind. You know, when we look at these people, Barack Obama and putting extra mirrors in the White House, totally obsessed in himself, totally obsessed in his own greatness. When we think about these judges or magistrates or these officials, and they seem incapable, completely incapable, of seeing the terrible uh, wreckage and, and hurt and cruelty of their actions, and they seem oblivious. This is a sign of being totally and utterly controlled by ego. So let's jump into that. We'll talk about ego, we'll talk about mind virus, and then we'll come back to virtue to see how, with this new knowledge of fear, we can find balance. So I'm going to read some of the sections that are going to be present in cognitive law. Again, I'm sorry, I've been working on this. I keep saying to you, week after week, there's coming. But you'll see, there's enormous depth to this, and it is taking time. So I'm going to read a couple of things from it, relevant to what we're saying. The first is, I've said this word mind virus, and I want to explain a bit more about what we mean by mind virus, and then straight into ego, and then straight into emotion, and then straight into virtue being keeping ego under control. So I'm going to read some of the sections on this, and I did read some of it the other day, but I want to come back to it because it is a, a pertinent subject. Remember, I made a promise tonight, and the promise is that I'm, I want to give you something tangible tonight, something real. When someone says to you, yes, Eucadia, I've heard about Eucadia, but it doesn't seem that anything works. Well, I want tonight to be an example where through this information, yes, it does work. It does work because it is more than simply painting by numbers. So mind virus. What do we mean by a mind virus? A mind virus, by definition of what we're saying, is an infectious, pathogenic, information-based agent that can replicate itself inside the mind, causing abnormal conditions affecting the mind and body of a higher order life form. Boy, what a mouthful. Okay, let's break that down. A mind virus is equivalent to the mind as a computer virus to a computer system. All right, well, you've all heard of computer viruses. If you're on a computer tonight, you've certainly heard of computer viruses. And computer viruses, as you know, infect a computer. And what they do is they corrupt information. Uh, and sometimes they do it in a fatalistic way. Sometimes the purpose of a computer virus is merely to spread the infection. Well, this is exactly what a mind virus is doing. Your mind is a computer. What else do we say? Well, while the state of a mind may be severely restricted in performance, temporarily or permanently due to a disease affecting the apparatus of the mind, the only valid pathogen of diseases of the mind are mind viruses, not biological. 
this is important 